Welcome to the Big Garden, August 1st, 2023, complete with dogs. It's about 7.15 in the morning, and what's going to be a low 90s degree day, I thought I'd walk you around a little bit before it gets too hot and show you what's going on. So these are my Marion berries and we did get a pretty nice little harvest out of here. Not a ton, but you know, it was good snacking. And then we also had a lot of this, which is just berries that even though they're watered, just kind of dried up before they were really worth anything. And some kind of a shade structure over this would probably be good, but these plants are such a pain in the butt, I don't know if I'm gonna bother. There's a few down there still coming in. And you can see here's some very old, the end of the season ones. But we did get some nice plants. And then this is not unusual, what you see here. So the plant produces what it's gonna produce and then it dies off. And so this is last year's growth that did have fruit and is now conked out. And so you trim that off and then all of this new year growth from this year gets put up onto the trellis. But it's also something that it's hard to have enough time to get to this time of year. You can see all the spent spots on this. This was probably the most prolific of the of the plants that were out here. So yeah, we got some we got some nice berries that we could snack on while we were out here gardening. This row is my sorghum and one very very large <laughs> very very large volunteer sunflower. But this is all sorghum grass that's in here. And I don't know, we're gonna see what's gonna happen. I think I said in the last video, I'm just, I planted it, it's a long season thing. I'm just gonna let it battle it out. There's a lot of grass in here as well. There's quite a bit of weed pressure. Um, but you know, it's not looking terrible. All of this is covered in bindweed. Um, but this is coming. And uh, it's the beginning of August, so it's got at least until so all of August, all of September, part of October. So it's got another two and a half months to go. So that's a good long time. We'll see what we got. I left that sunflower there because it wasn't hurting anything. And it's fun that it's got such a big head on it. This is another sunflower that I just left at the end of the row because it volunteered here and it wasn't hurting anything. I do that a lot. So these three rows, this row, that you can barely see anymore. This row and this row. This was all garlic and all the garlic has been harvested. I do have a smattering of other things in here. These are a couple of extra collard greens that I threw in the ground that were just extra that the garlic wasn't there because the gophers had gotten it. I have another couple of small rubecchias that are just lovely. Some marigolds. Uh, extra Swiss chard, a volunteer potato, you know, as one does. The next step out here is going to be pull the drip tape, mow, till, and then put down a cover crop. And that will reset these three beds. And that's always what I do with my garlic. I follow it with a cover crop that blooms late in the season and then gets tilled in in the early spring. Hey homesteaders, future Jen here. This is actually three days later because I was editing the video for this and realized that my camera was having battery problems and I ended up with audio but no moving video on the part of this that I filmed in this section. So um, yeah, we're back to show you the onions. We finished up with the garlic, and then this very, very weedy row is some perennial rhubarb, some anise hyssop, 
some horseradish, and a whole lot of weeds. And I have spent basically zero time on that this year. And I'm not feeling really bad about it, um, other than the fact that the weeds are gonna spread because that uh, fluffy weed seed is gonna end up everywhere. But other than that, eh, it's, it is what it is. You can only do so much. But the onion beds, I have three rows of onions here. One, two, and three. And they're coming along. Um, this was, pr I probably spent more time weeding this, these three beds than anything else out here in the garden. And you look at them and you still think, good Lord, woman, what have you done? Um, but there is a point when you've weeded enough that stuff has the energy to actually start heading up. And so even though it's got some competition, it's past the point of where it's super critical that every single weed be out of there. And so this looks really terrible, but you'll see in a couple of weeks when I actually start harvesting, you'll be surprised at what I'm actually getting out of here. So these are not doing bad. I am starting to see some of these onions flop over and that is always an indication that they're pretty much finished. Here's, gonna, here's an example right next to a weed. Let's get that out of the way. There we go. You see how this, you see how this is flopped? That's an indication that that's pretty much done. And for whatever reason, that's a very deep onion. Um, usually they kind of shove themselves up out of the soil. But if we dig around a little bit, and maybe get that out of the way. You can see, yeah, there's a decent little onion down in there. So that one's ready. This is Cipollini, this section right here. And then we move into Tropia. Those are both heirloom Italian onions. And then that's all of that row. There's a little bit more Cipollini in this row. And then this is yellow and red storage onions. This is, I don't sell these generally. These are for my own use. Um, but you can see back in there, there's a very nice sized onion and that isn't quite ready to harvest. So we've got another week or two to go on that. So that's doing just fine. And then here is a very nice red onion that is gonna be gorgeous. So yeah, onions are coming along very nicely. And then at the tail end of this row, there is a little bit of extra peppers. These are extra Aleppo peppers that I had um, that I just threw into the ground because I couldn't bring myself to throw them out. A volunteer potato that I should probably just dig up. A lovely marigold that has been blooming gloriously for over a month now. And then in here I have some rosemary. And I do a lot with rosemary in terms of my spice mixes and things. And so I try to grow quite a bit of it every year. It's not quite warm enough where we are for it to be perennial. And so it'll die once in a while, it'll survive the winter, but usually it does not. And so I just try to grow enough of it that I can get a pretty decent harvest by the end of the year. And I will literally just cut these plants off right at the ground because I don't think they're gonna survive through the winter. And so I just harvest the entire plant. Yeah, so a little bit of extra stuff, but almost entirely onions. And then this third row, this is shallots, which look very much like an onion, but they're a shallot and we're starting to flop over a little bit in some places here. So let me show you what that looks like if I can get that out of the ground, yeah. So there's a very nice shallot that is floppy and ready to dry and store. And then as we come down, this tail end of this row is leeks. And these are looking pretty good. Leeks are always a little bit slower. They're slower to germinate. They're slower to grow. They're definitely a longer project. These will be one of the last things to come out of the garden, usually in mid to late October. But some of these, like that's getting pretty good sized. So yeah, onions. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled program. So at the tail end of this onion row, I have cilantro. And it is blooming 
quite gloriously. Not quite as much as the other one that I'll show you in a minute. But I'm gonna get a lot of seed out of here. And if you come out here in the heat of the day, there are literally hundreds of bees of all different kinds that are in the cilantro uh, nectaring and getting pollen. So, oh look, you guys are probably not gonna be able to see this, but just underneath that bud, there is a lacewing. And lacewings are good guys in the garden. They eat other bugs. They're very delicate. And so that's a good sign. That's the whole point of having all of this pollinator habitat is we're attracting the good guys to the garden so that they eat the bad guys. Over on this one, there's a couple ladybugs in there as well. So on this side, this very, very weedy section because I can't mow the edges because of the runners that are running out are the melons. And you look at this and you think, ah, oh, there's nothing in there. And then if you actually really start to look, you guys see that? So there's melons in there. Let me get on the other side. And this is the row where I have cardboard down between where the melons are planted. And so the actual row itself is not terribly weedy, but the edges are getting quite weedy because these, you know, the melon runners, they run out into the aisle and I've lost the battle with trying to get them to stay in. And so at this point, they are everywhere and I don't want to run the mower with the mower. So this big marigold designates a change in variety. And so this is my other type of melon. These aren't quite ready. I did harvest one of the Hannah's Choice just yesterday. So the first melon to come out of the garden was yesterday. Oh, this looks pretty good. And the nice thing about this particular type, these are cantaloupes, is when they're ripe, yeah, that needs another day, they will slip off of the stem just with a slight tug. And so they're, it's easy to know when they're ready, unlike things like watermelon that take flipping forever and you never quite know and then you've gone through all that time and you harvest it too early. So you can see some nice melons in there. And this is a hundred foot row of melons planted about every five feet. So that's 20 plants. And actually each hill has multiple plants in it. So there's, we're gonna get a very nice crop of cantaloupe. I've tried uh, succession planting on these guys and I find that they need the heat of the summer in order to really taste good and so even though I'll often get a second crop off of these cantaloupe late in the season they are never anywhere near as good as the first ones to come off in the heat of the summer and so honestly it's just it's not even worth it there's a couple of nice big ones right in there. Not quite ready. There's also a very distinct color change that happens with these guys when they're ready. And so I look for that as well. So color change, sometimes I can smell them when they're ripe. There's three or four right in there. There's another really good sized one. So yeah, the melons are coming along quite lovely. I'm very excited, I live for this. I love this particular variety, it's called Hannah's Choice. And it is definitely my favorite of the cantaloupes. I know not everybody loves cantaloupe. I absolutely love it. And they're really fun to freeze, chop them up and freeze them or blend, blend them up and freeze them and make popsicles out of them or sorbet, both of which are quite lovely. All right, the corn row, you can see here. And I have mostly been ignoring this other than occasionally coming along and just doing this to try to spread some pollen. This row, I don't know, we'll see what we get. I'm not, I don't have big expectations because there's not enough in here and there's a huge amount of weed pressure because once I realized 
there wasn't enough in here, I just kind of gave up on this row. And so we might get a few out of here. That one's getting close, but I'm not expecting it to have good pollination, even though there's some decent cobs on there, just because we just didn't have enough in this row to do anything, but it might surprise me. We'll see what happens. Look at the weeds. Oh my God, you guys, so bad. But again, because it was a lost cause for the most part, and I had so many other things to do, just not a priority for me this year. This was, this was definitely mostly a fail. I'm feeling the sides of these. That one's ready. Because you can tell, once you get a feel for it, once you've done corn for a while, you definitely get a sense of when it's ready without having to peel it back. You can tell by how fat it is. So that one is really in good shape and this one is in good shape. So we'll come back later and check those out and see how they're doing. This one also pretty close. We're in the bean row and I think I did weed this at just the right time when I did that weeding just after the last video that I posted. So early July, I got in here and weeded this entire row. And so there's still weeds on the sides, but for the most part, they're out of the bed itself. And the beans seem to be doing well. So these are all dry beans for the most part. And this one is a little bit of a viner. And so I threw a quick trellis in there so that it had something to climb on. And honestly, I just don't pay a whole lot of attention to these until the end of the season at this point. So they just do their thing. Once again, flowers marking the changes. This is a very twisty Snapdragon, but this is my favorite colored Snapdragon. I absolutely adore that. I have a lot of black beans in here and a few other varieties. The one problem is you get this, which is instead of falling into the bed, they're falling out of the bed. And so the center of the bed is uncovered and it makes it a lot harder to mow because you end up mowing the sides of some of your beans. But clearly lots of bean set coming in here. So they're doing good. Again, another change in variety marked by some of these guys. So that's not supposed to be in there. But you can see the reason I have morning glories in this bed is because I have morning glories in the sunflower bed because look how gorgeous that is. I'll get over there closer so you guys can see that better. But the morning glory is climbing up the sunflowers just makes me very happy. And so I leave a few every year. Yeah, but beans coming along well. And if you get down in here and look, you can see there's lots and lots and lots of beans coming in there. So this is the black bean section. So yeah, excited for dry beans. And I love that it's mostly a hands-off crop for a good chunk of the year. This was a late planting of um, calypso beans or yin-yang beans. And so they're a little bit further behind. They're just starting to bloom now, but I thought I'd have enough time to pull it off. Look at this beauty. That was another late planting of the Snapdragon, but whew, boy, is she pretty. And then I have some volunteer yarrow out here that I love this um, pale lavender purple red lavender red colored yarrow it is one of my favorites and so that just gets to stay here this was my other planting of edamame just tucked in here on the end and it's it's probably a few days behind that other one in the perennial garden so our glorious sunflowers they're probably about three quarters of the way through their showy cycle and they're starting to do this you can see how this one has fallen over and that's not unusual they just get so top heavy that they conk out and i usually come in here with a big pair of loppers and just trim out the ones that are in the aisles let me see this is the one i wanted to show you guys i don't know if you can see this with the sun but look at that mixed together with that sunflower i mean how gorgeous is that come on yeah, how do you not want that in your garden? I'll take a look at it from this side so you get better lighting. 
got the sun in the lens. <laughs> Just gorgeous. And there's a nice bee in there doing work on that one. And then we've got some of the small little pollinator bees on this one. So everybody's doing its job. Beautiful. And I mow this. I have living, basically living aisles out here that are a combination of grass and clover and weeds. It doesn't, the aisles don't get any water to speak of. And so they do not get a lot of attention other than getting mowed. Uh, and they don't get a lot of irrigation. But what happens is I run the mower through here and it blows the ground up stuff, you can see it here, onto the beds. And I try to be selective in terms of which direction I'm going so that I'm blowing stuff where I want it. But this is basically a mulch. And you've heard of putting grass clippings, you know, composting grass clippings or putting grass clippings um, on your garden. That's what I'm doing. And so it took me years to realize that. I was just mowing it because I was mowing the weeds. And then I realized what I'm actually doing is fertilizing the beds at the same time, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Um, granted, that is probably part of why I have such a weed problem out here is I'm grinding up weeds and throwing them onto my beds for the next year. Um, but it is basically a living mulch that is fertilizing things with green manure. And so that's not a bad thing. This is the broccoli, which is pretty much finished. I did harvest about four pounds out of here um, just two days ago. And I have a shade cloth on it because we were so hot. But at this point, most of the side shoots are finished. Oh, there's a little bit still coming. So there's one there. There's one back in there. There's a few right here. The side shoots will get smaller and smaller over the course of the season. There's one right in there. Um, as the plants run out of energy. And then the other thing that happens is they get a lot of aphids and a lot of uh, cabbage butterfly pressure this time of year. And right now I can actually smell this broccoli, um, which means that there's probably a lot of aphids in here right now. I probably need to just come in here with some loppers and take this whole bed out because it's pretty much done. I mean, we're the first of August. This has been in the ground. You know, these got planted April, they went into the ground mid-May. So they've been in the ground for a long time and they're, they're done, they've done their job. This is a spring crop that needs to come out and I just haven't had time to pull it. Um, there's a big old hollyhock and none of my hollyhocks have bloomed. Man, I don't know what it is about how long it takes hollyhocks to bloom. They're almost a biannual where it takes a second year. Oh, can you see the hummingbird? Oh, that's interesting. There she is. She's actually actually nectaring on that morning glory. That's very cool. Yeah, none of my hollyhocks have bloomed yet this season. So I don't know if they're gonna bloom or not. This is the happiest of every hollyhock I have. And I probably have 15 of them out here and it's still not blooming. So I don't know, we may or may not get them. Maybe the timing's wrong. This is the cabbage that was the 100 day cabbage. And it is just about ready to harvest. That's a very nice head right there. Look at that. Um, so yeah, turned out to be a decent cabbage considering it's gone through all of the heat of most of the summer right now. And I have two different spots where I have this in here. What I should do is drag that shade cloth off of there and drag it over to this. This is quinoa. This was a late season plant. I forgot that I had bought the seed. And so I put it in really late but I have three or four of them that I think are gonna go to seed and are doing well. And what's completely amazing to me is how much this looks like lamb's quarter. I mean, it really looks like lamb's quarter. There's a little bit more of a sharpness to the leaves on the edges. And so instead of being rounded, it's pokey, um, a little more arrow shaped, but dang, it really, it's the same genus, different species. Um, but I'm excited, it'll be fun to see if we actually manage to pull off quinoa. Um, it is a cooler season crop. It grows in the Andes. And so it's been recently bred to try to survive in more hot climates, but super not adapted for that. <laughs> this is the Chinese sprouting broccoli. 
which I have let go completely to seed for the pollinators. And then it's almost done at this point. I could leave it and collect seed. These are, this is in the mustard family. And so the seeds in mustard family grow in these, they call them siliques these little skinny pods. Um, they come in a bunch of different shapes, but on a lot of mustards, you'll see this. And so if I were to let that go, let it dry, there would be a tiny little round seed in there that would look just like a mustard seed. And that would be more of this Chinese broccoli. I'm not, this is a, a species from Johnny's and it's, I'm sure it's a hybrid. Um, and so it probably would not grow true if I did that. So I probably won't bother. Um, another nasturtium. My ground cherries, which I've done virtually nothing with except occasionally snack on in the garden. Um, they're just so much work to pick for harvest for selling. And so I would really love to sell them and I have a market for them, but the labor on them is insane. And so I haven't done it. Look at this gorgeous cosmos, you guys. I'll, I can't remember the name of it. I'll put it up on the screen. This is, it's like it's on fire and it wasn't blooming when I did the last garden tour, it hadn't started yet. And I am just so tickled with this. It is so, so pretty. It's like an explosion. And if I just stand back and kind of look, even now it's only about seven, that's probably about 7.45 right now. Um, tons of bees in there, enjoying that. A few more of those 100 day cabbage, looking good. Very nice. I like that slight purple streak in the veining on that. That's quite lovely. Basil that I have also, just like my other bed, I have let this go to seed. So there's a little bit in here that's probably still salvageable, but at this point, mm, it smells good. Um, I'm just kind of letting the pollinators have this, but quite lovely little extra salvia that got tucked in here and is still blooming, which is quite lovely. And then of course, all the sunflowers. And the only one that I have this year that has any color is this guy. So this was a volunteer, but he's got some really pretty color. And I think I had a really deep red sunflower in this location last year. And I think that's why this one has some color. It's probably a baby from that. But really stunning. We're getting to the end of it, you guys. These are the green wasabi radishes that I planted. And I was hoping that they were daikon. They are not. They're just regular radish. Um, they've held surprisingly well, given all the heat. Um, I have no intention of eating these. I just threw them in the ground because I had a ton of the seed. Um, let's see, I'll show you what they look like. So they are the green, let me get that into the shade where you can see it better. So it's a green radish that's supposed to have a wasabi-like flavor, so very hot and spicy. Um, I was kind of hoping they would go to seed here uh, and then replant themselves, but I don't think that's gonna happen, so kind of fun. Just, just had the extra space, so threw them in the ground. Again, this sunflower just falling over. They just fall over everywhere this time of year. This is potato. This rest of this entire row is potato. And I need to get in here and start harvesting. We've managed to kill a couple of gophers in here. And the plants are not looking great because potatoes are a cool season crop. And so they really don't love the heat. And so you can see, you know, they're looking a little dry, they're looking a little tattered, but there's potatoes in the ground. I know there's potatoes in the ground. And I, like I said, I purposely, oh, there we go, see? There's a very nice potato in there. And so if I, I'm trying to keep stuff covered and I blow the, the cuttings into this bed, because I'm trying to keep those potatoes from getting sun and turning green because once they turn green, they're really not all that great to eat. There's a few that are just right on the surface there. In fact, I think I'm just gonna, I'm not sure why those are laying there the way they are. I'm gonna put them in my pocket and take them in and probably eat them for breakfast. The green onions that I planted in here, they are ready to come out. 
most of them are anyway. And so that will probably be my garden project for tomorrow. Got too much other things going on today, but you can see that those have matured up quite nicely. And again, an incredibly hands-off crop where I literally just put them in the ground, planted them right next to the strip tape and selectively tried to put them right where there was a drip hole and then have just mostly ignored them other than occasionally pulling some weeds. And so it's a nice way to get a secondary crop. There's another one of those hollyhocks that's not doing anything. It's a nice way to get a secondary crop off of your potatoes without having to do a lot of work. The ones down here are a little bigger. These look quite good. So yeah, nice, nice scallion crop there. All right, on this side, we have all of the peppers. And we also have, this is the, the double click cosmos. So this is the other cosmos that was in here. This was starting to bloom when I did the last garden tour and it's continued to bloom. So very, very pretty and a lot of variation. Um, this one, you know, you can see this is more of a pink, not a deep, deep red. This one is more of a deep red. So yeah, quite a bit of phenotypic variation here. And then you can see how deep red and much more frilly this one is compared to the one we just looked at. So there's a lot of phenotypic variation here, but really, really pretty and long blooming. It's been blooming now for a, a full month easily. Um, I have one of those between each of these pepper plants. To show you peppers, the tail end of this bed, this is the Japanese cucumber. I'll put the name on the screen. I can never remember it. These are really, really prolific and they don't get bitter in the heat. They're a really nice slicing cucumber. Um, that one's probably needs another 12 hours. It's just about perfect. Um, really delicious, lovely, very prolific cucumber. This that you see here, that's scarring the fruit rubbing against the stems of the plant. So pretty easily damaged. But yeah, this is, gosh, maybe six plants, if that. And I have harvested probably 30 cucumbers off of this so far, and it's still going, and it's not even all the way to the top. I did have a Kajari melon here that died, and so I pulled that out. This is why I have calendula all over my garden, because this was one of the calendula plants that I've just let go to seed, and those will end up spreading. This is Thai basil, more Thai basil. And honestly, well, the pollinators love it. It makes a lovely syrup. And I just love the smell of that, even though I don't like licorice things, which makes no sense, but I love the smell of this. Another anise hyssop in there, you can see, that needs to be harvested and dried. And then this is dill. Not quite as far along as the dill in my other garden, but coming and like stuff like this one, like this is ready to harvest for sure. So those are ready to get clipped and thrown into a paper bag so that the seed can dry. This one, same thing. And dill will reseed in your garden as well, depending on the situation. And so inevitably I'll drop a few of those and I might get a few extras. Okay, this is our habanero. And not seeing any fruit on there yet. It's a different genus species than or different species than most peppers and very, very slow for me. This is, I believe, the pumpkin spice jalapeno. It's coming, but very slow. And I don't have anything yellow yet, which is really what I'm waiting for because I want the orange on this. But, ooh, that plant is really loaded. There's a lot of peppers on there, so that's good. And I need to trim these cosmos back. They're a little bit more spready than I expected and so they're kind of covering some of the plants. This is our Hungarian black um, and so you get this beautiful black color and then when they're ripe they turn red and I have been harvesting this. This was probably the first pepper 
that was ripe in the garden and the plants have flopped over a little bit, but this has been wildly prolific. You can see how this cosmos has just grown completely around this pepper plant. So yeah, we need to do a little trimming there. Although the shade, I don't think this time of year when it's this hot is hurting anything. Um, this is regular jalapeno. And again, still coming. I've harvested a handful out of here, but not yet. This is cayenne. And I only have a few of these because I just dry them and use them as a dried red chili um, for red pepper. And I don't need a lot. They're always really prolific. And I always have a lot of dried cayenne on hand already. And so I haven't needed, I think there's four plants in here. So this, this is a Thai chili and I've got some nice production on here but nothing's turning red yet, so they're taking their time. But good size, which I'm really pleased to see, because a lot of times you buy Thai chilies and they are teeny, teeny, tiny, and the smaller the chili, the longer it takes to pick very many, and that is maddening. And so I specifically sought this out because it turned red when it was ripe and because it was good sized. Because if I'm gonna take the time to dry chilies, I want them to be a little bit larger. This is our Sugar Rush Peach. And these plants are absolutely loaded. And my peach tree has also gotten ripe and I have harvested a ton of peaches off my peach tree. And so one of my projects is to do a peach, sugar rush peach uh, hot sauce this year. And that is a project that I haven't gotten to yet. I'm freezing the peaches so that I have them ready for that when I'm ready to do the hot sauce. These will turn um, from kind of this pale yellow green to a little bit more of a deep yellow orange and they're not quite there yet. And so I'm giving them a little bit more time on the plant, but really productive. I'm very excited about that. They're quite lovely. This is, this is my Korean gochugang peppers. Um, and if you just dry and flake them, you basically have gochugaru. Um, and I haven't, I need to taste one of these and see how hot they are. They're supposed to be you know, kind of medium heat and very fruity and lovely as a pepper flake. And so that's what I'm planning on using them for. And I'm sure a few will end up in a hot sauce as well. But this has been a very prolific plant and they've gotten ripe faster than almost anything else I have out here. And so that's that's been quite gratifying. I think I have a total of six plants in there. This is the cashmere that I grew last year and loaded with peppers, but definitely not anywhere near ready yet they will turn really bright red when they're ready, so we're not there. This one is Berber, and so this is the Ethiopian Berber pepper that I plan on drying and making uh, chili powder with. I'm very excited about this. This, was a, this one is new to me this year, and these, when they turn ripe, they should be almost brown orange. So kind of a brick color and loaded with peppers, but we're not there. Definitely have some more time to go on those, but super exciting. And then all the rest of this row is the classic Anaheim style green chilies. These are called Joe Parker, and they are one of the chilies that's grown in Hatch, New Mexico. Here's a good example. You guys can see that. And I've harvested probably 15 pounds of peppers off of here yesterday. And so these are doing quite well. They're very prolific. This seed source is from Sandia. And I have had better luck with the Sandia Joe Parker in terms of productivity than I have with other Joe Parker peppers. Joe Parker is pretty common. But um, the particular seed source that I'm getting these from, I think, has made these more prolific. I really get good harvest off of these every year. And so I'm selling these fresh right now. And then I will roast and freeze them and sell them as uh, roasted peppers in the winter as well. This is our uh, poblanos, which are falling over because that's what they do every year because they're so darn tall. But I really have some beautiful peppers in here. None of them have turned red yet. And when they're red, I dry them and turn them into chili powder. They're called ancho when they're dried. 
That's a really nice one right there. You see that? But I also really love them just as a roasted green pepper. And we make, I make one batch of chili rellenos out of them every year. And so I think we're just about to chili relleno season. And I also probably need to get in here and just thin these out a little bit because they're really, really loaded. Um, not quite as big as I would like. Ooh, that one's coming with me. I felt that snap. Not quite as big as I would prefer. I would like them to be about a third again larger. Um, I think these guys are really heavy feeders and I don't feed them quite as much as I should, but just a beautiful, beautiful and very tasty pepper. Um, I love them roasted. This is all the Aleppo. I've got a lot of this. I dry this and sell it and then it goes into several of my spice mixes. And so I have a lot of them out here. And they're really prone to sunburn. You can see I've got a little bit of sunburn right there. Um, but I just cut that part off. It's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt anything. This is the one I showed you guys last garden tour where I said, oh, that's definitely a cross. They are now getting ripe. Um, but this is definitely a cross and not a full Aleppo. You can tell that just by looking at it. And what I tend to do with these weird ones is I just save them for myself and I'll dry them and use them as chili flakes. And so we just get a lot of variation in our chili flake, which is kind of fun. This is what they look like when they're fully ripe. So nice, nice red on there. I need to probably do a quick early harvest on those. All right, this is, I think everything else from here is different kinds of paprika peppers. And so they're doing pretty good. I look for a full red in this, obviously, because paprika peppers, you want them to be fully ripe. But they're coming. Um, here's a nice, that one's quite good. And I, you know, as I'm in here picking or checking, I just kind of sporadically weed this stuff. Look at our, this was the amaranth that volunteered in here and it was in between the plants in such a way that it wasn't hurting anything. And so I just left it and it's been quite fun. They're really beautiful. I'm, I'm gonna have more amaranth than I can stand in here next year. Um, but the leaves are edible when they're small and obviously you can harvest this seed and it's also edible and they're a beautiful ornamental. I think this one is more of the, the actually grown for its seed to eat variety and then this one obviously is more ornamental I've got a couple different kinds in here um, but yeah super fun and just very pretty and you know kind of gives you some delight in the garden this is bulldog paprika and those are definitely ready some of these are ready to come out and this one is I can't remember I'll look up how to say this and put it on the screen. This is a Basque um, paprika pepper. Let me get the bindweed off of this. Not my favorite thing. And so it's coming. And I grew this one last year, but it was from a seed swap. And I wasn't sure if it was from the original commercial variety or if it had been saved seed and possibly been, had been crossed. And so I bought it from the seed company this year so that I knew for sure. And then this one, these are guajillo, so this is not a paprika pepper. This is a Mexican chili. You can see I've blown grass onto these. There's one starting to get ripe. So this is a guajillo, and I have fallen in love with this pepper as a eating pepper for dried and used in stuff. It's incredibly mild. It doesn't really have much heat to speak of, but it is the best flavor in the world. And so it's a really nice addition to homemade chili powder. And so I'm just growing these for the first time this year. And then lastly, this is our last pepper. This is called, this is a dog nose Calabrian pepper. And so this is the one that I had my friend send me the seed from the UK because I couldn't get any Calabrian pepper seeds in the United States. It's interesting that this is a vertical. Not very many peppers do this where the, the peppers grow straight up instead of down. So that is unique. I'm very excited about this guy. None of these are ripe yet, but they are loaded and they're coming along quite nicely. Oh, I see a little bit of color on that one. So 
um, excited for that to be ripe and to get to taste that. There are a bunch of different types of Calabrian peppers, um, not just one, it's named for the city. And so um, doing a bunch of research, I decided this is the one I wanted to grow and we'll see how it is. More cilantro, this got planted earlier than the other cilantro that you saw. And you can see we're almost past the flower stage. I think those are the most beautiful little delicate, lacy, fairy flowers. I just love them. I think they're really stunning. But you can see we're starting to get actual seed here. And that's why this is in here is I'm gonna harvest all of this seed. But again, great for pollinators. Another anise that just kind of got plugged in in some spots. Some more of the holy basil that I didn't do anything with. <laughs> and then this was a little bed where I just threw some extra um, snapdragons that I had. And whew, look at that beautiful, beautiful color. I'll put a link to the, this is a mixed color variety from Johnny's, I believe, but absolutely stunning. And then these are also all snapdragons. Uh, Madam Butterfly, I think. They have a very, very different shape. But I absolutely love these. The first time I saw these in a bouquet at a farmer's market, I had to ask what they were and then find the seed and grow them because I think they're just stunning. And I've been meaning to pick myself a bouquet so that these grow more and I just haven't done it. So the yellow is also that. Chant it might be Chantilly too. There's a couple of different ones I've got in here. Um, but yeah, just fun flowers, fun color. Here's a Kajari melon that isn't dead. I think this one might actually get all the way to ripe before the plant conks out. The other one next to it is dying, like this one you can see. And I don't know what it is. They just don't, Kajaris don't like it here. Um, they're getting plenty of water and they're on the same drip system as everything else out here. And so there's no reason for those to be conking out, but they don't like my soil for some reason. And that's okay. This is lemon cucumber. And these have been really slow to come on. I think there's a few in here, yep. This is a really lovely cucumber. Again, does not get bitter in the heat. I just don't bother with, with uh, cucumbers that get bitter in the heat because we get hot so fast here. This is a really great eating cucumber and really, really prolific once it really gets going. But this plant has been very slow. I did get a slow start on the seed, and so I didn't get it in as soon as I should have. Um, but it has been very slow to produce. Oh, there's one that I missed. Okay. So that's about as big and as yellow as you want to pick them. They really should be pale colored. They call them lemon cucumbers, not because they taste like lemon, but because they turn this lemon yellow color. And that is what they do when they're mature. You want them smaller than that. So this is about as big and as yellow as you want them to be. Um, don't let them get all the way yellow. They will be, they will have really big seeds and they won't be nearly as tasty. I'm running out of places to put things. <laughs> I got a poblano in one pocket and big fat cucumbers in another. All right, last but not least, the best for last, of course, we have the tomato and tomatillo row. These have been amazing so far. We're just really getting going. People are always surprised if they're new gardeners at how long it takes for tomatoes to really start to crank. Um, it's not something that happens fast, you know? It's a, tomatoes are a long game for sure. Um, tomatillos, I've got two different varieties here. Uh, Rio Grande, I think, is one. And then Purple Blush is the other. And I have harvested probably easily 30 pounds of tomatillos out of these four plants, and mostly out of these three plants. This one, it got real unhappy, and then it kind of recovered, but it hasn't been super prolific. It's not super happy. This is the purple blush that is actually showing a purple blush. Let me peel this back so you can see it. Um, and weirdly, I've planted, that's actually really pretty. I planted this seed pack out a bunch of times. This is, it's probably three or four years old and I've never had them show up purple like this until this one plant. So I don't know what that's about, um, but maybe it's the stress, but this one has not been as prolific as the others. I did do a video where I made tomatillo salsa 
Um, I'll put a link to that below. And I used mostly these purple tomatillos because I'm selling these and the purple tomatillo is a much harder sell than the green. People don't quite know what to make of it because they've never seen it before. It tastes exactly the same. But you can see here, this is what they should look like when they're ready to harvest. They should be bursting out of their skins. And I have a 100 foot shade cloth on the south end of this entire row. And so I'm shading these. They don't really need it, but I had extra. And so rather than just leave it on the ground, I just tucked it up onto the, the trellis. Cherry tomatoes, I'm getting lots. Um, many, many pints have come out of here so far. And we're just barely to August. Mm, that's a lovely tomato. These first two are sun cherry, I believe. And then this is sun orange. Sun Orange has been amazing. This was the first one to start producing. And I do think it is probably produced more than anything else out here. And they are delightful. They're supposed to be a better variety of um, Sun Gold with less cracking. And that's pretty much what I've seen. I have not seen any cracking of any fruit at all this year. We haven't had any rain though. And so that's that could be part of it. We literally haven't had rain for probably a month and a half at least. It should go without saying I'm in the western part of the United States where most of the western U.S. gets less than 20 inches of rain a year. Everything in the west is irrigated. It's just a given. Um, so people that can plant a garden and just let it rain and not actually have to water. Yeah, I don't know who those people are, but they're definitely nobody I've ever met. This is a black cherry. And these plants, quite prolific in terms of growth, but not a lot of fruit set. They are really just starting. I've gotten a handful every time I picked, but not very much. I really love them as a cherry tomato. They're very, very tasty, but um, yeah, not, not a lot of production yet. Mm. But absolutely delicious and a unique flavor. And so what I wanted I have two of these, two of these, two of those. What I wanted was a mix of red, orange, and black cherry tomatoes in my baskets this year. And that is what I've gotten, but it's been mostly red and orange and not nearly as much black. A few other varieties here. This is, I think, Gardner's Ecstasy. And she has been fairly prolific. It's interesting, these have got a little tiny nipple on the end of them, so that's unusual. It's nice, not quite as sweet as some of those others I've just eaten. I don't remember the name of this one, I'll put it on the screen. It's been more productive than the Gardener's Ecstasy. This might be, I don't think this is red berry. I think this is some funky Italian variety. Mm. I think that's a better tomato. Tomatoes are so subjective. Everybody has their own things that they like and they don't like. People always talk about low acid tomatoes. I can't imagine wanting a low acid tomato. I want that acidity in there. <clears throat> but yeah, I'll probably save seed from this one. This has been quite productive and it's a very nice tomato. And I think this is, yeah, this is Ivan's Red Berry. And not wildly productive, but it was early. This was one of the first ones that I had. I'm just tasting these as I go. Hmm. Also very good. Yeah, I like these two. I like these two more than I like the Gardener's Ecstasy. Those were all new to me this year, so. Um, but this is the one that I would do again, just because it's been the most prolific of the batch. Again, I'll put the name on the screen. This is some of my saved seed. This was a red cherry cross that has the potato leaf style. And she has not been super productive this year. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Mm. Tomatoes are really sweet though. Super yummy. And then this is another of my crosses. These were all accidental crosses. 
This one is a cross of sun gold and German pink. And so the tomato, the cherries are a little bit bigger and really delicious, which is part of why I saved the seed. Not as sweet though. At least that one I just ate. This one is called chocolate sprinkle. And it's a unique shape. And this has been fairly prolific. And I've been putting this in the baskets because I didn't have a lot of the, the black cherry um, because it looks so pretty. I mean, it's got that great kind of variegated color on there. So pretty. Not wildly prolific, but I've gotten a nice harvest out of this. Thicker skin on these for sure, but really nice balanced flavor. And these are my two Prince of Pieces. And I looked them up because they're acting so weird. And this was saved seed. I finally looked it up. This is seed that I saved from Principisi. And I think this is crossed with something because this is not what a Principisi typically does. They're usually, you know, this time of year, they'd be all the way up to here by now. They do still have the distinct little nipple, but even that is not as pronounced as it normally would be. Yeah, there you go. There's the nipple. Um, and they're not as red. Um, they're more of a yellow. So I think this, I saved this seed and I think it's crossed. Um, tomatoes cross a little easier than people will lead you to believe, especially when you have beehives on your property. All right, running down the rest of this row without going into great detail. Um, these next six plants are my kind of medium sized slicers. I have Canner Hole, Mortgage Lifter, and Brandywine. This is the brandy wine. I can tell just by the leaves. All of my, I, I have tags on all of these, but the tags are on the south side of the plant, so it's actually really hard for me to know where I'm at. Um, but brandy wine, this particular brand, brandy wine that I think I got from Peaceful Valley Organic, does well for me. It doesn't get super huge, but I like the flavor and it's quite prolific. I slice and dry these, and so these are mostly for slicing and drying. Whew, that's got to be a mortgage lifter. That's a huge tomato. Um, we've done a small smattering of tomatoes out of here so far. Not a huge amount of production just yet, but we're getting there. This is probably Cherokee purple. No, that's still mortgage lifter. Okay. So it didn't come down as far as I thought. We've got some nice fruit. Coming in down in there. So we'll pick that in the next couple of days. I don't have a lot of problems with... Um, critters getting into my tomatoes and eating them. Once in a while, I'll find something that's bird pecked, but it's not bad. So that's been a good thing. So I usually can let things ripen on the vine and I appreciate the fact that I get to do that. This is Valencia. And Valencia, let me see if I can get my camera down in there to show you. Oh, there's a huge cluster of them down in there. Is a yellow tomato, really delightful. Uh, one of my favorite eating tomatoes, and again, about the size of a baseball. What do we got here? I think this is, so this is the Japanese black trifle. Not a big tomato, but really good eating. It won a taste test last year that I was at, and so I decided to grow it this year. And I haven't really, I haven't gotten a ton of production off of it, so I don't really have a good sense of it yet in terms of flavor. This is Cherokee purple. I think. And as is true to this every year, I get really nice production early in the season. These look beautiful and they're gonna look gorgeous mixed in with other harvests. And then um, the plant just pitters out and I don't get much late in the season every year. But we're in that beautiful first flush where we're starting to get some very nice fruit out of here. This one, Paul Robeson. So this is Paul Robeson. Paul's not looking real huge this year. I remember him being quite a bit bigger last year. Not sure why. Not getting a lot of big fruit off of here. So possible this plant is not really as happy as it could be. Um, this was one of my favorite eating tomatoes last year. Really, really liked it. And I probably have picked a couple of good sized fruit off of that already. So this is Anise Noir, also called pineapple. And I really love this tomato. Um, this is a good example 
um, although they get quite a bit larger than that at times. But really, it, it gets kind of the mottled, tie-dyed type color when it's ripe. It doesn't turn fully red. Got one down here that I need to get out of there and off the ground very soon, or I'm gonna end up with a hole in it. But really good eating and just absolutely delightful. This is Virginia Sweet. And so this is a big kind of orange yellow beefsteak tomato, really delicious. They're just coming. There's quite a few back in there um, that aren't quite there yet. And then this is supposed to be, oh, this is Dr. Waichi. Yep, sorry. I've gotten a lot of Dr. Waichi's off of this already. I find this to be a quite productive plant and some really nice fruit coming in. Um, that one is ready, I need to pick that. But gorgeous, tasty. This one is Aunt Ruby's German Green. And I have a feeling that there was a tag mix up on this one because I swear I picked orange tomatoes out of this the other day and Aunt Ruby's is not an orange tomato. It is a green tomato that turns just slightly yellow green when it's ripe. Back in there somewhere, there is an orange fruit. Um, so it looks to me like this might be a Valencia, another Valencia. I'm not really sure what's happening, but I don't think this is what it said it was. And I don't know if I messed up the tag, it's certainly possible. Um, or if it was a mix up with the seed pack because we're all at this point used to that. Um, but it's possible that I sold a bunch of Aunt Ruby's to people and then it turned out to be Valencia, but not a lot of people buy Aunt Ruby's anyway because they are freaked out by green tomatoes, so not too worried about it. This is my San Marzano Redorta, these three plants. Not a huge harvest off of these so far, but you can see the size of these paste tomatoes. Really good sized, lovely. Um, so much less peeling if you're canning with these. And they're coming on pretty strong at this point. I'm starting to get some nice fruit set in there. And these plants always look terrible. This is one of those ones that for whatever reason, they just look awful. <laughs> and it's not anything specific, they just look awful. And then these are San Marzano that are not Redorta. These are San Marzano two from Johnny's and they are much, much smaller. You can see the size difference here. This has been really prolific. I've harvested a lot of tomatoes off of this already. So definitely much earlier than the Redorta. But again, if I'm canning every tomato I pick, I have to peel and that is a lot of work. And so the smaller the tomato, the more peeling I'm gonna have to do. I grew this because I couldn't get more Redorta seed this year and I wanted to trial it. Um, I haven't done a side-by-side -side taste test yet and I do need to do that as well. But prolific plant, nice little Roma paste tomato, but again, not nearly the size of what I was hoping for. So that's the tomatoes, they're doing good. Nope. I did have a hollyhock right there and it would appear that a gopher has just pulled that right into the ground and eaten it, which happens. My irrigation system is on right now. All right, so from this side, here is the August 1st garden. Beautiful. Thanks for joining me, guys. Come and check it out in September. Thanks for watching, tribe. We'll see you next time.